All right, All right. So question number one. I'm going to kick it off with some questions that came in on some of our previous lives. Nice. Um, <clears throat> sorry. This one is from Garrick Tate. Um, Tom, can you explain more about why you say that all opinions should be binary? Yeah, you know, it's funny. <laughs> this is something that drives people crazy about me. So um, not all opinions should be binary. So let's start with that. When you're trying to make a decision, it is super helpful to exist in the world of hyper binary, like aggressively black and white. Mm -hmm. Because if you ask people like, um, what did you think of this show? Okay. You're going to get like these waffly answers. People are going to try to be nice. There's so much social convention that you're not going to get a clear answer. When you need a clear answer, force people into love or hate. Because then you like kick in mechanisms of there is nothing other than like blinding joy and like despising something. And that really forces people to be clear in their own mind about what they want. Because people try to dance around it. They'll try to like protect feelings. They'll try to not back themselves into a corner. But I find that if you push them like into one of those binary extremes and look, I'm all about letting people back out. It's like once you give me your binary extreme, okay, cool. Then we can have the real conversation about where like the delineation is, where the shades of gray and all that are. But like just give me a hard stance like for a second. Let's see where people really are. And I've just found that it, it's, it is very adaptive. It allows you to move quickly. It allows you to understand like where the isolated um, opinion is. Hmm. So it's a tactic. It is not like I live my life in that and that everything right. I either love or I hate it. Um, I just find That's that exhausting. it would be, but I find <laughs> in a big organization, especially, and I, when I say big, I mean like beyond three or four people, there's so much couching of language. There's so much like I'm a pleaser. My wife is a pleaser. In fact, I'll tell you where this all started. My wife and I are both pleasers. So we really want to make the other person happy and it becomes paralytic and you're not able to make a decision. You're not able to move forward because you're both trying to like guess like what the other person wants. Yeah. And it's like, don't do that. Like just say exactly what you want, like give it in a super binary way. And then once those opinions are out there, then you can find common ground. But if everyone's trying to guess then it just, it's a nightmare. So be binary in the beginning, figure out on the extremes where everything is, and then you can work your way back from there. That's smart. All right, this next question is from Michael Price. How do you find the best metric for success for your startup? There really is only one, and that's are you making money profitably? And the, the reason that's so important, and it's one of those, like it's stupid simple, but the reason that it's absolutely critical is that is the only mechanism that will allow your business to sustain. That's it. And I, I really, really worry about the state of technology today because there's so much money, like take AR and VR, there's so much money being thrown at these technologies mm -hmm. that the vast majority of these companies will die. They will cease to exist and they will cease to exist because the product that they're making does not deliver enough value to people that they're willing to pay for it. And because of that, just a lot of money is going to be lost. But the thing that actually worries me is that people will look at those businesses and go, but wait, like so, like in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars have been right. thrown at the technology. And so people confuse investment with like business success. And right. so that's where this gets my, my theory about Wookiee is falling on its face right now. No, I think it'll, it'll um, be fine. So that's where this really becomes a problem is when people can't, See the difference between speculative dollars being spent and actually building a profitable business. So focus on building a profitable business. That, at the end of the day, is the only thing that matters. And some of the sex appeal of a business can be lost in that. And, and that is just a, a lame fact of business. Like You may have to pivot to where it becomes something that you're not super interesting interested in as the entrepreneur and that's one of the reasons that like really committing yourself to be an entrepreneur you have to think about whether that's really what you want or not or if mm -hmm. you want to go to an organization that's already found a path to profitability and they're doing something that you really passionately believe in and giving yourself over to that cause that company um, rather than try to build something from scratch because you may have to like keep changing 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 until you find the path to revenue and then by the time you find the path to revenue it may, may not be something that you're keenly interested in it's uh it's a tricky game yeah, so I've heard. Slowly right. learning about it. All right, so this one comes from John. Um, you are such a great speaker. What was your process for becoming so good? I know it was compound moments, but what specific moment stood out? Um, high school speech and debate. 
So that, I mean, like that's where this really all began for me, high school speech and debate. And then every day at lunch, so I used to want to be a stand up comic. So every day at lunch, um, I would do, I can't remember how long lunch was 30 minutes, 60 minutes. I don't remember. It's probably like an hour. Okay. So let's say it was an hour, 55 minutes or something. Ish, right. Yeah. So by the time you pick up your food and sit down, let's say that I had a remaining 40 ish minutes every day, Monday through Friday for four years. I was doing a, essentially a stand-up routine at my table, and I just considered it my job. There was one kid that if you really got him to laugh, he would actually, whatever he was drinking, he would spray it through his nose. Oh, my God. And my thing was like, if I couldn't get him to spray something through his nose, then the day was a failure. And at <laughs> the, the time, I lost. did not think about it as being practice, like in that way. I just wasn't, mm -hmm. um, I wasn't self-aware enough, but because I was so hungry to do the thing, like I was so hungry to make people laugh that I ended up spending all of that time doing that. So I, I've never run the math on exactly how many hours that is, but it is a lot of hours when you stretch that over four years. So I spent a lot of hours doing that and that just, you know, process, like improving the verbal processing centers of your brain just by doing it over and over and over. And then really like actually making it a competition by going into speech and debate. Um, that was incredibly, incredibly powerful and having to take both sides of an argument and understand structure and brevity, which I am not exactly known for now, uh, <laughs> but certainly was a technique that, um, I really had to employ. Excellent. Okay. Sorry. So this next question comes from Mary soul in the comments. I would like to know more um, about the internship program. Can nice. anyone around the world apply or is it just U.S. only? Could you explain a little bit more about our expectations here? Yeah. So this, our ideal scenario is that it's local people here in Los Angeles. I am a huge believer that the best way to build community is proximity. And what I mean by that is just FaceTime, actually spending time with people. Um, now, the internet is an amazing thing and it, it really can get you a long way. Um, and I think that engagement in online communities is very, very powerful. Um, so we are open to um, international, but there are, there are just inefficiencies to getting something done when you have to do it over the internet. But there are certain things like design um, that can be done relatively well from anywhere. Um, so mm -hmm. yes, we are definitely um, offering internships and design for people that are overseas. Um, so it comes down to skill set. If you're really interested, email us at connect at impacttheory.com. That's C-O-N-N-E-C-T at impact theory, which is written on the TV behind me. Um, impacttheory.com. And then, um, yeah, tell us what your skill set is, where you're located, and if it makes sense, then we can move forward. Uh, and if you're in LA, um, that would be amazing. We would love to have you um, come out and, and let's see how we can work together. So that's our fantasy. Uh, but yeah, we'll we're be open. fun. We're open. It's fun. All right. So this one comes from Laura K. Hi, Tom. Laura K. Laura K. I have a call scheduled with her. Is yeah. she in the feed right now? She's in the feed right now. Laura. My most humble apologies. I think I it was totally actually my bad. No, you, no, no. You know my thing, right? It's all I my know. fault. So it's I'm never going to blame anyone else. Laura, it was my fault. I apologize. I totally flaked on you yesterday. My bad. So uh, I humbly beseech you for forgiveness, and I will be calling you because it's literally right after this. Yes. Uh, so it will be amazing. I look forward to it. All right. But it was actually my bad. I put it in your calendar wrong. So it's all right. either way, like we all drop no. balls, but as the Greeks at would the say, same time, my fault. Vasa. Right. And translated, that means... It's like, no worries. All right, no problem. What, what is it? Actually, min fuvasa. My wife would have to chime in, and she's going to think I can hear, but of course I can't. Because uh, <laughs> we still haven't mic'd that woman up. I know. Uh, yeah, but it's no something, so we'll just pretend it's no worries. <laughs> All right. So anyway, to Laura's question. <laughs> yes. What are the challenges and benefits of spending your time building your own app versus just building up a large following on existing platforms? Ooh, great Ooh. question. And the answer is, um, at the end of the day, if you don't control your audience, you're in real trouble, but there's real power. So um, I would say like 95% of our community right now is on platforms that we don't control. Um, that is definitely a problem, but it's also where you're going to get the high velocity. So, um, we are on a long-term basis focused on getting people over to our emails newsletter, which if you haven't signed up, oh my God, we have to shout out agent Smith. So he put a, a sign up bar 
on our website. I was so impressed. So he put a sign up bar on our website and it more than three folded our conversion rate. So we took it up by over 300% on our website, which you can check out now Go and sign up, up. impacttheory.com at the <clears throat> bottom of the page. He created this sticky bar that just, it's for you to sign up to our newsletter, sign up, you know, our shtick, we're trying to add value. So we're not going to waste your time. We're not going to spam you. And we sure as hell aren't going to sell your data. Um, so yeah, you can sign up to that, that one and, and by all means, feel free to test us and, you know, create like a, an email address or something. That's the one that if it ever got sold, that you would know it was just us evil bastards. We would never do that. <laughs> uh, you guys can count on that. That, that is like community suicide. So never do that. Uh, but yeah, jump in the water's warm. Uh, so that's at the end of the day, that's what you want to be in a position to do is really have them in your ecosystem in a way that other people can't control right now. Facebook can change the algorithm. They've already done it before you reach now on Facebook, something like 1% of your followers. That's crazy. Um, same with Instagram, right? They could make a change, Twitter, all of them. They can make a change at any time they could go away, but they're incredibly powerful tools. And so I think that it's awesome to invest there, to get people to leverage what is being done. Um, and I would say step one is very much leveraging those tools, go where the audience is. And then over time by adding value, you want to bring them into an ecosystem that you control. Very true. Them's is the true words. Definitely. Owned versus rented property, yeah. I think, is the concept. Hashtag truth. Um, so this one comes from Craig. What do you define as great wealth, and what is your definite purpose? End of life goal, meaning that you can die the day, die that day and that you knowing that you accomplished it. Okay, so this is a trap. Um, <laughs> so I will... It's a trap. It's yeah, a trap. I will answer it knowing <laughs> that this is a trap. So... Uh, great wealth to me is, to me, um, is money. So having lots and lots of money. Now money is inert. So you need to know what you, now inert just means it does nothing. Like look at money. Like imagine a world where you were the last person alive and what does money mean then? Nothing. Okay. So that, right. that is, that is money's true nature. Like at least gold, you can melt down, you can turn into things. Um, but money literally, other than I guess you could burn it. So I guess it can be converted into heat energy. Um, so that's kind of cool. Sure. But in today's world, it is, it is a facilitator. That's it. So money facilitates things. If you don't know what you want to facilitate, the money will not bring you anything interesting. If you know what you want to facilitate with money, money is incredibly powerful. That to me is wealth. Now, fulfillment, on the other hand, has nothing to do with money. Um, I won't say it can't be touched by money because really like... Impact theory to me is very fulfilling. And the people that write in and say, oh my God, you've changed my life. You've done this. You freed my mind. Like you've allowed me to start this business to whatever. That is insanely fulfilling to me. And I love that and believe that it's my highest calling is to help people do that. And the only reason we're able to do that is because I have amassed wealth. And that's what's fueling all this. It means that I don't need a job. It means that we can build the set and have all these cameras. And so, and, and it just has my undivided attention. So all of that is a result of having accumulated wealth. So I, I am very much, um, I think accumulating wealth when you know what you want to do with it is incredibly powerful and very important. Um, but chasing money for the sake of money is, is like a failing endeavor in the highest extreme. And I just cannot tell people enough. You have to make one minor tweak and I'm going to amass wealth by bringing value to the world. Oh, okay, cool. In a thing that like makes me feel my most alive, right? Because let us make no mistake. Impact Theory is a for-profit company. Okay. Everybody's clear on that, yeah? Clara. So that that's like uh, people need to understand that. And the reason that that is so is because I want to accumulate more resources and it needs to be self-sustaining. Like otherwise we're going to do this for, you know, call it five or six years and then we're done. So it's like, hey, yeah. you, at some point, like it's got to be self-sustaining. So that wealth to me is money. Fulfillment is the thing that's all mental. It's a mind game. It is totally about finding that thing that makes you feel most alive, helping people. I just... Maybe it's just me or maybe it's just people like me, but I think it's more universal than that. I think humans are wired to help other humans. We are a social species. We're a pack animal. Like we want to protect the herd. And because of that, I think that we're chemically rewarded for being of service to other people. And I think there's something in us that just makes wants to make the world a better place. It is obviously not always true, but like, yeah, even people that do crazy shit, like in their own demented way, like they thought they were making it better for at least a group of people, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just can't, other than serial killers, like is anybody really setting out to help no one other than themselves? Not usually. 
Not usually. Like it sometimes is a distressingly small group of people that they're trying to help, but it really is usually like at least their click. So I just think that we're wired for that. So, and we're living through this amazing social revolution where you're being held accountable. I think it's awesome. I think it's really changing the way that yeah. people think. And dude, social media, man, you can hate on it all day long, but it has empowered people to make demands and say, here's how I think we should be looking at the world. And I just think it's, it's a one-way street. I don't think it ever goes backwards. Absolutely. I've also received a request for you to move your mic a little closer. How are we doing? Uh, is better? Hey, everybody. Is it better? Welcome. So nice to have you today. <laughs> the radio um, whisper the radio uh, yeah that's the like radio if whisper. i wasn't such um a lot like when i get excited i get so loud i would literally talk like this the whole episode it sounds better i sound it, deeper it does it, it does a little right? bit it, because it's like it gives that intimacy Ye yes <laughs> it's intimacy intimacy is the word yeah. i'm looking for thank you um, so hopefully that helped all right so our next question comes from laura defrain um, hi guys, how do you balance learning concepts to help with growth mindset, like watching IT, reading books um, that you've recommended versus actually going out and executing? Like from a time perspective, how much time do I spend on each? Uh, yeah, let's break it down in that tactical way. Um, I, it's 80-20, right? That's the sort of famous rule. You want to spend 80% um, of your time is is um, should be focused on actually executing and 20% of your time, maybe like I definitely don't percent, I don't spend 20% of my time in taking. I try to spend more than that, but I think 80, 20 is a, is a reasonable, um, split, but doing is, is ultimately the, it's the only thing that adds up to anything. Like if you're, if you're learning all this stuff, but you don't then do, if you don't go out and execute, like it just doesn't go anywhere. So yeah, spend as much time doing as you can. You just have to actually have the skills to execute against it. Dope. So I just want to give quick shout outs to some of our impact theorists or well, impactivists around the world. Nice. Um, coming in from Bellevue. Um, Washington? Bellevue, Washington. Big ups to Bellevue, yeah, man. Yeah, Bellevue, Bellevue, Washington. And I've lost his name. Um, Andy Moss from Toronto. Um, Mary Soul from Mexico. Nice. And Mexico in the house. Paris. Have. Paris is also Paris, in the house France? too. Paris and France, yes. All right, respect. All right. About that Paris. My All wife and I had a magical weekend in Paris. Like yeah. straight magic. So a uh, super dear friend um, of ours, uh, somebody that I've known since I was like 18, got married in She's Parisian. So hey, it makes sense that she got married in Paris. Uh, and we went there for that and just had an unbelievably good time. And it was the first time I was introduced to a straight foot fetish. What? <laughs> I was waiting for that. So, <laughs> I, I, God, I wish my wife was here right now. I think I was looking for a restroom. So my wife and I had split up. We're on the streets of Paris. We'd split up. And um, I was like trying to find either where we were trying to end up or a restroom or something. And I come back and my wife was like, some dude just like took photos of my feet. I'm like, what do you mean? And she was like, he came up. He didn't speak English, but he was like pointing at my feet and asking if he could take pictures. And she was like, I totally don't get it. She was like, I don't know if he just liked my shoes or what. And I was like, no, baby. That is not why you want to take <laughs> pictures of your feet. Uh, so yeah, right now someone somewhere in Paris has my wife's feet hanging on a wall somewhere in, uh, I think, red heels, if I remember right. So, yeah, oh, those dig are cute. It. I don't have a foot fetish, so that's just weird to me, but, you know, God bless. And like, you know, God to each it. their own. Um, this one comes from Iet, Ian Pettit. Ian Pettit so, sounds. Pettit we know Ian sounds. Pettit. Um, if you are in the Rebel Alliance, what is the Empire? Wow, what an what? awesome question. What is the empire? I'll give yeah. you the cheesy answer first. And so okay. this is what my subconscious threw up, but I, I don't want to commit to this answer. Um, a fixed mindset. That's real. No, that really is right. Okay. Um, that is what my life's mission is to fight against. That is a fixed mindset. Um, I don't really, I don't think that even like, so, okay, I spent, in, in fact, the, the way that I amassed wealth was in fighting the food industry. I don't think the food industry is evil. I, I really think it's people that um, they just get myopically focused on something stupid, and that's profits. And maybe, like, people do individual actions that, sure, if you're looking at, you can be like, that was pretty sinister. But, like, when you really, like, what are they trying to do? They're trying to feel good about themselves. They're trying to protect their family. They're trying to do something cool that makes them proud. Like, they're not, um, they're not sociopaths, right? They're just not. And you can see people do crazy shit that we would all stand back and go, 
dude, what? Like, that's gross. That's super nasty. And I see people do it all the time, but I don't think they're evil. I just think they're stupid. That's the truth. And I've been stupid too many times in my life to like hurl too many stones. So I'm just trying to like bypass all that. I'm not trying to change the system. I'm trying to go and impact individual people. And now given the tools and technology that we have, I think you can affect them en masse. So really what I'm trying to say people against is a fixed mindset. It's themselves. Absolutely. Word. All right. This one comes from Sean Delaney. For a young entrepreneur, would you worry more about learning from a mentor or getting out and doing it on your own? I would get mentors wherever you can, but there's no substitute for firsthand experience. But if I were to do it all again and I were in my early 20s, I would pick the person who's living the life that I want to live. I would. You guys have heard me give the spiel a hundred times before. Find the person who's living the life that you want to live. Go to them and say, I'll work harder and smarter than anyone you've ever met. I'm going to do it for free for 90 days. At the end of the 90 days, if I've added value, then you're going to put me on payroll. If I haven't, then we part ways. All I ask in return is knowledge and introductions, um, connections. And that's it. And I think that it, that that would have short-circuited so much of my learning curve because people that have been there and done that, they're going to give you those codified nuggets that allow you to see the world in a much more useful way. Mm -hmm. And it's really that. It's about that perspective. <clears throat> it's about reframing things. It's about knowing how to conceptualize the world. And the, the reason that we ended up on um, using traditional narrative at Impact Theory to have the kind of global change that we want to have is I just know that's how people take in new paradigms. It's, it is a way, since you can't mentor the world, um, you've got to like incept them where they are. Um, getting that embedded into traditional narrative, getting a growth mindset embedded. Like if everywhere people turn, all the characters that they admire and look up to all have a fixed or all have a growth mindset and talk about that and the dramas related around people going from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. And then you have social content married to that saying, watch like this journey, like Superman 2 may be, um, you know, like one of the greatest movies ever because he loses his fucking superpowers. And so like everybody laments, like there's no great story to tell with Superman. Of course there is. Take away his powers and then you find out what he's about or, or have him deal with the emotional struggle of not wanting to help, of like being ultra powerful and being like, dude, I just want to live my life. Like I want to mm -hmm. fall in love. I want to. So it, people get caught up in, in like the trappings of that. But if, if we're telling all these stories that revolve around, you know, how to transcend some of these counterproductive um, human tendencies, going from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, and then marry it to social content where we're talking about that, I think that you can really speed up. It's the closest thing I could think of to a global mentor. So, and that's what we're all about. We're all about that global mentorship. Yes. And uh, my daughter has I'm got something to say. Because I think someone came in the front door, which I is know. supposed to be illegal while we're, we're filming. <laughs> so what I love, and people never get to see is Bonds. I just like, what's up? He's like, who's that? Here. He's oh. the elder statesman of the group. So, and he's having, can, if we can digress for a second, he's having neck problems. Aww. Bless him. So we had to take him to the vet. So now he like doesn't pick his head up to look at you. He just kind of lifts his eyes. What's up, Aww. buddy? You the old man now? <laughs> yeah. He got his name because he used to be such a like maniac. So it's weird. That's so weird. Yeah, for the maniac I, now I don't to be like know maniac ultra bonsai. chill. No. He got his name because as a puppy and he's tiny because he's a chihuahua, he, uh, he leapt leapt like Superman Stilo off of the arm of a couch. So not even like the low part, the highest part, <laughs> and literally like straight arms out. And so when he did it, I yelled bonsai. And then I was like, okay, well, that's... <laughs> well, that's obviously his name now. That's and so my wife, amazing. though, for a long time spelled it like the tree. And I was like, that's not his name. His name is not bonsai, okay. which is like zen and the tree that you sculpt. Yeah. It's bonsai, like what you scream is you're a kamikaze pilot crashing. So... Okay. which is, I think, long live the emperor. We've really gone tangent now, yeah. uh, but I like to secretly believe that's part of why people tune in. <laughs> I could be wrong. I, I love the tangents. All right, okay. there There's a good one for you. So this one comes from Ryan Kuhn. How do you separate from your current tribe without burning bridges to pursue your goals? God, you know my instinct was to yell into the mic, burn those bridges. Um, no. <laughs> no, I, I think you do. I, I, you don't be a dick about it. But I think you do. Well, I, I, you can't worry about it. So here's my thing. Have empathy at all times. Be compassionate right. at all times. Be kind at all times. Like I have, when people are always like, hey, man, I've got somebody in my life that have a fixed mindset. What do I do? And the answer is just be compassionate. Like have empathy, right. love them, and don't judge them. 
But at the end of the day, like don't let them drag you down. So if you need to get away from those people, it's like nothing but love for each and every one of you, but I need to go in this direction. And I think, I think people can feel that. I think they know if you're like turning away because you are judging them or you're turning away because you're just trying to do something that's good for you. Right. And, you know, I mean, look, I had to really, um, I had to carve a path that was very different from what everyone else in my family had done. And, but because like, like I'll give you an example. This is a real example. Um, so I think it was a second cousin of mine. Um, one of my mom's cousins, I think, whatever that makes them to me. Great cousin. I don't, it doesn't matter. Um, they, so we're all sitting, it was like Christmas Eve or something. We're all sitting around the table and they roll up and he's like a long haul trucker and like blue collar in the end, literally missing most of his teeth. And he wears like, he grows his mustache to like cover it. And I think they were high. Like if I'm mm-hmm. honest and, um, like everyone scattered from the table and I was like, no way. Like these, are, like, I want to engage. Like, I want to know like, what's their life about, you know, like let's connect. Mm. And so we ended up having this awesome conversation. It was so rad. And I ended up, I learned like CB call signs and like what some, I for, I've forgotten them now because this was quite a while ago, but like for a while, like I knew some of the like cool ways that truckers like communicate with each other, that mm-hmm. like there's cops ahead and all this stuff. And when you lead with compassion and empathy, good things happen, right? Like absolutely, shut off the judgment. Just like, what can you learn, right? Like there's always something that you can learn from people. So anyway, if people feel that all the time, like it doesn't matter that you're carving a path in a totally different direction because when you're there, it's like loves, hugs, cuddles, like sincere desire to know them, understand them, where they're coming from, what they're about. Um, people feel that. Someone was just asking me about my interview style And I was like, dude, I'm not a fucking journalist. I am not a journalist. I am not here to ask hard questions. I am here to show you. I I have been inspired by you, which is why I've invited you on the show. I want to share what you've offered me with the the audience. And hopefully I can also learn in real time. Like that's what it's about. And that makes people feel seen. It makes them lower their guard because they know I'm not trying to trap them or trick them. I want to give them an opportunity to shine. And so if that's how you come to the world, I promise you can like go do your thing with your five new people and nobody feels left behind or anything. They'll, they'll get it. it. You just have to make them feel like make people feel better about themselves when they're around you, period. Whether you're like, I've got to get away from this person or not. If I'm with you because you're family or whatever, I don't want to cut you out of my life. Like you're going to feel better about yourself for being around me, period. Absolutely. I mean, I definitely would never burn b- bridges. I would. No. With kindness. But yeah. Light those motherfuckers like, on fire. I don't know. It just feels very destructive. So. Yeah. I mean, I guess slight, by its nature, slight, like, burning bridges. Distancing. But. Yeah. It's interesting because I can't allow myself to say I wouldn't burn bridges. It's funny because my whole long diatribe sounded like not burning bridges, but I'm all for. Right. Which is letting them, that's why I was yeah. like, wait, no, no, that's true. That's true. Wait it's true. a second. Because maybe we're, do you define burning bridges as like, um, I'm never talking to you again or like, something like that? That that ship has sailed and we've lit this bridge on fire. I'm not crossing back over there. That's interesting. Like, that's the bridge. It's burnt. Yeah. I can't go back over there. Bye. Yeah. So, so if, that's why I don't define that, it that if way. If burning a bridge requires you to be a jerk, then yeah, I'm not for burning bridges. Yeah. So for me, I would never burn a bridge because I, I always like leave myself open to anybody who I've ever had. Fair. And I'm also the person who, if I've loved you before, I will always love you forever. So feel free to come back into my what life. What if they're cruel to you? Even I will like treat them with kindness. I just know that I can't engage with them for extended periods of time or anything like that. Just know that I don't want to waste the energy of hating someone that's totally not it's not useful so you know if you're cruel to me then i also respect myself enough to know that i shouldn't hang out with you every day for the rest of my life yeah no i totally hear that i think that's wisdom yeah so there we go um and this one actually came in yesterday from sindre hellsmark um So, Tom, could you create a platform within the impact theory community where we can register um, and communicate with one another? Indeed, we can. Yeah, we can. So we're working on that right now. Super glad you asked. I promise this is not a plant. It's Um, not. It was so funny. I saw that question. I was like, March 27th, guys, like be on the lookout. We'll, We'll launch our official impact theory Facebook group. 
Um, and look by out the for... way, Cindy just did a big presentation here internally for that. It's going to be dope. You guys are going to love it. Yeah, I'm really so... excited. So look out for the invitations. Feel free to connect with me so that you can get early access and just get in there and start engaging and, and hang how do you out want with them each to other. Connect you? Uh, just you. find me on Facebook because nice. it's all going to be done through Facebook. So Okay. And under what username? Well, it's my Facebook. It's Cindy dot Okereke. So O K E. I was gonna say you need to R E K E. So Facebook.com slash Cindy dot O K E R E K E. Boom. And connect. Nice. Great. All right. So then <laughs> the next question comes from Jumaine uh, Cabrera. How would you attack a startup that provides a service as opposed to a product? How would I approach a startup that's yeah. doing a product and a service instead of a product? Mm -hmm. uh, there's other than the logistical steps of getting the product put together, there's really not a difference. You're, it, all the fundamentals are going to be the same. Um, the great news is with a service, you can usually give it away a lot easier than you can a product because there's a lot lower cost. It's just the cost of the human being. And usually people are starting in an industry where they are the one providing the service. So now you really can give it away. Um, so with a product, you have to find something that's tangential to do on social media to really deliver value. Um, unless you can afford obviously to just actually give away the product. So I think in, in a lot of ways, while a service business is a lower margin business, the service business is a lot harder to sell for a massive multiple. Mm -hmm. Um, it's easier to get early wins than it is with a product because you can give the value away. And if it's real, if there really is value there, um, you can give it away and then people are going to want more. And by the way, I will just give you a tip. If you're in the service industry and you're afraid that you can give away your secrets in like, a um, uh, uh, one interview or something and you go in, you want people to sign NDAs and you're like, you know, I'm, why would I give you an hour for free? Like these people are trying to like scam me and get my info. You don't have anything real. I'm just going to tell you that right now. So if that, like, if that ever triggers in your head, you have nothing real. And I will say I have very deep suspicions. I won't say what just happened, but I have very deep suspicions that uh, and you can either back me up or tell me I'm crazy, that recently one of my ideas that I went into a very large company and pitched, um, I believe that they just straight ran with it, right? Yeah. And so <laughs> internally, everyone was like, LOL. what? Uh, LOL. And literally in their announcement about this thing that they're doing, they all but quote me in the article, uh, which was kind of amazing. And I was just like, whoa, am I really that powerful that like I can walk in and give people That's an idea cool. and then they go do it? Like that was amazing. So rather than be pissed that um, that they didn't involve us in an ongoing way, it's like it was just an idea, right? right. So it all comes down to the execution. Now I would have loved just because it would have been so fun. I really wanted to be it. involved in the execution, but it's not like they stole anything real. It was like it's just a fucking idea. So um, yeah, people get super wound up about ideas. I will do exactly that a thousand more times, even if every time, because I'm telling you, when you meet people like that and you give ideas like that, eventually, like somebody goes, I would just really want this person to be involved in the ongoing. Mm -hmm. And that's when you have something that's real. Like I'm literally trying to give away every tip and trick that I have in the, all the content that we create. I'm trying to get, like, it's not like I'm giving like, oh, I'm giving you like some thin layer of my <laughs> advice. I am like, if people would stay, Day. Like if, if it actually performed, like I would just do more and more and more content, giving stuff away, more free, more away, like, ah, because I know that people won't outperform me and I know that they can feel, I really want them to, like, I really want them to be great. And that to me is just it in today's world. This may not have always been the case, but in today's world, that is a winning strategy, build community of people who believe, like, think about this for a second. Between Inside Quest and Impact Theory, A, we've been viewed over 165 million times. Okay, oh, super random story. So I've said it a thousand times. I don't think people believe me, but I've said it a thousand times. Actually, it's true. I'm introverted. I had no interest in stepping out into the spotlight until the world of uh, marketing changed and it became apparent that people, that personal brands are a big deal because people want transparency. They want to know what you're about. They want to know how you're going to spend the money, all that. They need a person. Um, so... I went into Shake Shack yesterday here in Century City and the guy uh, like running fries, I'm not kidding, comes like running up to the front and he was like, are you that dude from YouTube? 
<laughs> and I could not bring myself to say anything. And, but I was with Jim quick and Jim goes, yes, he is. <laughs> and, uh, so it was like, so Jim, and literally that happened in the middle because Jim is also introverted. So Jim and I are having this conversation about how visibility fame is useful, even though we like don't seek it. Literally the words yeah. are like hanging in the air <laughs> and the guy comes running up and asking if, and I thought this, this is the era that we live in now yeah. where by putting yourself out there, by trying to give things away, by showing people who you are, by trying to add value to their life, you can build a community of people for whom they believe you have changed their life more than anyone else. Now imagine I come to you and I say, hey, we're gonna be producing our first piece of content, or guys, I am now officially involved in this company and it's making something that I think is good for you. I don't need you to buy it, I just want you to look at it. And if, it, if you think it will add value to your life, then please buy it by all means. But now I can control where people look and those people feel like, whoa, like I owe him something because he's done so much for me. Like that, Cindy, I can't, that is so powerful and it's never existed before. It's never existed before. Yeah. And to really have that kind of visibility, you either had to be a celebrity, but you were gonna get famous for something else, right? You're gonna get famous for being an actor. And so all your activism was like tangential to what you do, mm -hmm. but now you can literally build. So, I mean, this is all still related to the service question. Like all that value that you've built is tied to the service that you're trying to sell. So get out and give it away, give it away, give it away, give it away now, uh, <laughs> give it away because that's where you're really going to make connections. You're going to build value. You're going to get a community of people that really believe in what you're doing. And, um, you know, I've given like some of the companies that I've invested in, I go and just give them like full blown presentations, um, trying to help them be successful. Now, am I incentivized to do that? Obviously, but how many others investor, how many other investors do that? Virtually none because people think, well, I already gave you my money. You make something happen with it, but it's like, I want to help. I want to help. I want to help. And so, yeah, it, it, an amazingly powerful time. There's not a lot of difference between a product and a service from that perspective. Um, if you're asking me what's a better business to get into product, you can make money while you sleep a lot easier. It's easier to sell if you choose to do that. Um, profit margins are usually a lot higher, but do the one that makes you feel most alive. Absolutely. And with that, I'll stop. <laughs> All right. This one's from Dan Bro Fitness. Dan Bro Fitness. Woo. Um, besides Lisa, who has influenced you the most? I think the only honest answer are my parents, but that's not what people want. <laughs> um, so the books that I've read have been amazing. Stephen King, huge, huge influence on my life. He did not mean to, um, but he showed me that I did love to read. I just hadn't yeah. yet found what I love reading about. It was a huge, huge deal for me. Um, Tony Robbins has had again until I met him. He didn't even know I existed, but he'd had a huge impact on my life. Uh, my former business partners, Mike and Ron, um, huge impact on my life. Those guys were amazing. Um, they still are, uh, yeah, like that's, um, I could literally keep going on with authors, author on author on author, um, because those guys have just had such a tremendous impact. Yeah. I feel you on that one. And if you want to know which one is just my 25 books, 25 Tom's reading list on the, on impacttheory.com. Yes. Nice. Good promotion. And I'll say Joseph Campbell. I'd be remiss. In fact, he's the only one that has that's really made me permanently alter my body. Yeah. So shout out to Joseph Campbell. He, I'm so sad. And he makes my, you know, like who would you invite you table living or dead? Joseph Campbell. Four ways. I'm horrified that he didn't make my radar till he'd already passed away. Mm, yeah. That's so sad. That is sad. Mm -hmm. All right. So this one actually comes from Laura K. Um, Laura K back in the house. Yeah. The greatest rapper in the feed. I promise you. <laughs> she's got she can pretty, throw down. She's, like, she's got, got, got rhymes. Flow. She's yeah. got rhymes. You got to check this girl out. And it's all like in fact, Laura, drop, a drop, mindset. Yes. Drop in the feed a link to your YouTube. You should do that. People should check you out. Yeah. Check. Yeah. Check Laura out. Check her out. All right. So this question, um, I'm going to pose it to the both of us, but it was for me originally. What are your top pieces of advice for social media growth right now, especially for reaching and keeping an audience of Gen Z and millennials? I think you're the one to answer this question. Let's hear it. All right. Well... So this will mostly be based on gut because I haven't done enough research to adequately answer your question, but just watching social trends is definitely um, transparency and authenticity 
are super key for Gen Z and millennials right now in terms of um, people are a lot more careful with their dollars these days just because we don't have as many of them, especially like millennials and then up and coming Gen Zers, they're seeing like the debt that everybody's in. And so they're making different financial decisions. So the same way that you could put out a product and be like, it's the best thing, like all your friends have it, da da da. People are kind of caring less about that. Um, so, you know, like I have friends that when we lived in the same area, we would just share a set of luggage like if we weren't traveling together Whoa. yeah so it was like really nice like luggage basically we all like tripped in invested in it and so we used it to travel because we were all in like same proximity so it's just this idea of like collaboration is a big one because people aren't going more so to like traditional um like record labels and all of that kind of stuff to you know grow their personal brand so it's all about kind of building these relationships with the people around you and online. So if you see like Chance the Rapper, he's still an independent artist because for him, it's important to be able to control his art and also, you know, establish and cater to his community. He never wants to change who he is to be anything else besides the person that he is. Um, and so I feel like right now for millennials, Gen Zers, like that's kind of the path. So it's, feeling empowered by social media as a tool to get your message out there and then also living in a world where it's all about collaboration and growth together. Um, and yeah, so I think those would be like the biggest things. So it's not necessarily selling. It's definitely all about adding value as much as you can and being as honest and truthful. So even when I worked in retail, like I was always the sales associate who told you like, Honestly, I didn't like the fit on this personally on my own body. Like the fabric's great. It's awesome. Go ahead and try it on. I think this will be a better fit for you. And the thing is, people appreciated that honesty. So people came back to me and specifically would ask for me when they're shopping to, you know, help them out. So the thing is, it's it's just understanding that people just want to be related to on an individual basis or like on a one on one. Um, yeah, one on one basis. Um, and then scaling that. Love it. That's a great answer. Yeah. What respect, about you? Respect. Um, well, let's go somewhere. Uh, you, you so hit it. Like, so let's define terms really fast. Mm -hmm. So millennials are like, I think 33 ish to like 21. And then, uh, Gen Z is, uh, five to 20. I think that's sort of yeah, the, the rough like breakdown. Um, so what's fascinating is that, um, so millennials sort of began this trend. They Social media got introduced to them when they were already around. It wasn't always something, but they were the early adopters. They got it. Um, it wasn't like a, an arm twisting, at least not for the middle to younger millennials. So that began this trend of like a different level of interaction with businesses, a different way to associate and um, uh, connect with brands. But they were they were really like the brand generation. And they were, I, I call them the entrepreneurial generation. They very much wanted to control their own destiny and social media gave them a lot of power, gave them a way to connect and a voice in a way that generations previously didn't have. And I think that really shaped the way that they view the world. And then you had the crash in 2008 and that's where Gen Z's grown up. And Gen Z watched, A, they had social media basically their entire lives. And they've watched their parents struggle through the Great Recession. And so I think that's, you know, to your point about um, them having a very different relationship with money, uh, I think that's where a lot of that came from. And they've been referred to as the altruistic generation that they're, you know, you've got seven-year-olds who are like, don't give me birthday presents, but instead, like, donate to this charity. Um, and, and I think that's really an echo of the millennials who really were becoming aware of social causes, um, being able to connect. And, you know, I think millennials can, can take responsibility for things like the Arab Spring and stuff like that, where social media empowered them to really push back. But then I want to know who's going to take responsibility for the fact that those all failed. Right. And so that's become my obsession. And how do we make sure that those movements don't just start, they go all the way through mm -hmm. and that they have tremendous um, change. And, you know, oh God, I'm so not political. So I'm way in over my head here. But looking at um, 
that you're you're living through this age where we have these uprisings, but then we also have terrifying things happen, you know, here and elsewhere, uh, where politically it just seems like what is happening. Uh, so that's super surreal to me, and and so becomes part of the you know the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, so looking at that and looking at the difference between those generations. Um, I, there is nothing other than inviting them into your world, you know, to your point about transparency, like for companies to succeed in the future, it's not going to be about like, how cool is my brand? It's going to be, what does my brand represent? And so I think now as entrepreneurs, we all have a very fundamentally different question that we have to ask. And people trying to get a job in a company have a different question to ask. And they have to understand that interviewing is a two way street and that they should be asking like, as a company, what do you stand for? Like, what are you about? And that is, I think, a, a super, super important um, thing that not a lot of people are thinking about. And so the only way to really answer that question is by being transparent, by putting yourself out there, by telling people what you stand for, by showing them what you're doing with the proceeds, by telling them like what your end mission is, like what is the goal, like really, really putting it out there and letting them be a part of that journey. Um, and so I think, ironically, this all comes from... Um, my big fat Greek wedding, uh, but this notion of the community will always be the head, always, always, always. They make the decisions. You cannot tell the internet what to do, right? That mm -hmm. is like one. That was one of those things that when um, Nick Robinson first said that to me, I thought that is so smart. Like to put words around that, to understand that the you know the ask a ask the audience question on who wants to be a millionaire only works because you're listening. Right, you ask yes. and you listen. You don't tell, and so if you want to tap into the wisdom of the crowd, you have to understand that you don't ever get to tell them what to do, but you can be the neck, and you can direct them as to what you want an answer on, and mm -hmm. that is so powerful. And so we're living in this age where, if you're willing to be transparent, if you're willing to leverage the tools that you have, if you're willing to ask and listen, that being able to control the question becomes really powerful. And if you're willing to accept the answer that you get, then you can build something incredible. But you know, it, it comes down to the things that you put your finger on authenticity, transparency, um, real connections, you know, we are simultaneously a brand and a person, right? So mm -hmm. people can write in, they know that they're going to be talking to you, or they know they're going to be talking to me, or they know they're going to talk to Lisa, or Dr. Finesse or Agent Smith. And then we have two other incredible people who absolutely despise yep. being up front. Um, <laughs> but Casey and Courtney are amazing human beings and are by their own desire, the most invisible people uh, at Impact Theory. But um, I do everything I can to, in a way that they will find enjoyable, um, bring them a little bit out so that people can see uh, and relate to them. But I, I think that's the that's the paradigm. Do that and, and have good intentions and the rest will take care of itself. Absolutely. All right. This is our next question from Corey, um, who's finally made it to a Facebook Live. He keeps missing them, like by yeah. the just skin of his teeth. I saw those so, comments. This one's for you, Corey. What's up, Corey? All right. Welcome. So it's a follow-up to what Ian proposed. So when starting a business in a small town, let's say less than 10,000 population, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on building with a team? Um, is it better to go solo for a while or bring others in from the get-go? And if bringing others in is recommended, how would you go about finding those other people with the same goals? Two-parter, <sighs> multi-parter? Yeah, this is, it, it's so, so, so important and is one of the most difficult things ever. Um, if I were to be doing it and starting from scratch, I would find people online just as if I were single, I would be dating online. Um, I've never done Tinder, so I have no idea if that's like a nightmare or not, but it is. Um, it, all of this stuff is about meeting enough people that you can find people that really, really fit your mentality. And that is not easy. Um, but doing it online to start, and then I would never partner with somebody that I hadn't met face to face because there's still just a huge portion of what you can read from their physicality, the way they hold themselves, the way they yeah. micro expressions, all that stuff. So, uh, but I would find somebody online, I would meet them in person, I would make sure that we really had shared values. I would try to find a situation in which I can see them under duress. It's very hard. Um, I used to do that in interviews where I would make it stressful. Uh, which is a lot easier when you're interviewing uh, because I wanted to see how people handled it. I wanted to see, um, you know, sort of where they went. Um, and, and right before I transitioned out of Quest, um, we were doing interviews as like huge groups of people. Yeah. Like you would walk into a pack of 20 <clears throat> people in your interview and just be like, what is going on? Yeah. Um, and then our job was to one, 
really assess how you handled that big surprise. And then two, can we help you lower your anxiety levels and really see the real you? Because that, that's the flip side of that coin is you may put someone in such an artificial situation, you're not really seeing them. Um, but so that's, that's the thing. I would use the internet. I would meet them in person. I would really see if we shared some values. Um, and, and the key isn't whether you do something with other people or not. The key is, um, do you have the right people and do you need to pay them? Because the only reason not to team up with people immediately is because you don't have somebody that you really, really share a vision with because that's super critical mm -hmm. um, or that you can't afford to bring on an employee because that, you, you, you know, obviously um, it gets a lot more problematic when you have payroll. So I think as a startup, um, it's really about finding other like-minded people who are willing to work their asses off for free and you, just, you really, really have to find the right person and it is, you should be as serious about taking on a partner as you would be taking on a spouse. I'm not kidding. So um, I just can't tell you the nightmare that ensues when partners don't agree um, and that, whoa, that really, really becomes a nightmare and is exactly like breaking up with somebody. So um, be super careful and then, you know, if, if you've managed to build something in the interim, um, it gets dicey, but I, I've talked to so many high level entrepreneurs that have had massive exits and I will tell you, they all say the same thing. And that's, um, so frequently what causes a company to really go into turmoil is, is infighting. So you've got to be, be super careful of that. That all comes down to selection. Absolutely. And just a reminder to everyone, um, be sure to share this live feed or, you know, if we're adding value to your life. Um, in order to win an Impact Theory t-shirt. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. So this one comes from Sean Joseph. What are the key characteristics that the IT team looks for in a founder applying for startup theory? Um, really? Okay. So I'll just give you the honest answer. Uh, we need to make sure that people aren't crazy, that they're not going to get um, on camera and just be super weird. Um, so that's one. Uh, and then do they, have they really thought through, um, their vision? So uh, we need people that can articulate what their company is about. Um, if they're in the idea stage, do they at least have really great questions? Um, is it something that can be made universal? That's another big one because at the end of the day, this isn't about the person that you're trying to help. It's about the community. And right. so it's always about serving the community. And if there isn't something that's universal in what they want to know about, um, then, then it gets really tough. Like if I don't think there's anything, um, that can be extracted. Um, and then it, it needs to be something that, you know, we're not starting at scratch and somebody's just like throwing out like a random idea and Hey, what should I do? So the more developed it is, the better. Um, not everybody's going to have a full fledged product that's already on the market, but, um, the closer that we can be to that so that we can really get into, cause I find in the specifics lies the universal and right. that the, you know, if you're, it's just all conceptual, it's just going to be another episode of Q. Q&A. Um, so way more interesting if they have like really specific things that they need. Yeah. Um, and I really love the thing that you just said about in the specifics lie the universalities because mm. um, that really just resonates with me as nice. a concept. Um, this one comes from Michael Foster. Michael Foster in the yeah. house. Yeah. What is the number one thing you tell yourself each and every day? Um, oh God, so much of this stuff is now automatic for me that if you were actually tapping into my brain, um, what you're going to hear are, you'll mostly hear the whirring of autopilot. Like I've done such a meticulous job over the years of making sure that all of my subroutines are beneficial. Um, mm -hmm. so there, there isn't anything like that. I think it's more, let, rather than say it's something that I do every day, let's, let's re ask a slightly different question that might get a more useful answer. Um, and, and in a few like genres of things, what do I do? So if I'm feeling overwhelmed, so yesterday for like, a, like a 30 second period, I actually felt overwhelmed and I thought I, I was about to articulate it. And then I thought in saying this out loud, I'll focus on it. So don't focus on that. Um, take a second to be grateful for like, like what's something in this that I'm okay. So I'm feeling overwhelmed. Ah, I have a, just a wall of opportunity. I'm super stuck. I'm like, that's amazing. So literally like that, I went from like this feeling of overwhelm 
to being just incredibly grateful for the wall of opportunity that is at all times approaching us. Um, and so that was super useful. Um, when I wake up in the morning and I really don't want to get out of bed, you would hear my mind search for something to move towards. So I'm not a move away from guy. I like to mm -hmm. move towards things. I like to be excited about something. Um, and so that's how I get myself in the gym a lot of times. Like I'm excited. Uh, it's usually I'll go if I'm really like not wanting to get out of bed, I'll go to something aesthetic because it's so immediate. Um, like, oh man, I'll, my wife will be super turned on by my arms or what? Hey, just yeah. hashtag real talk. Um, and that'll help me get out of bed because I can move towards the excitement of that rather than move away from, you know, like, oh, I don't want to feel lazy. Like I don't. And that is a motivating factor, but it's not nearly as cool as like my wife being stoked on how I look. Right. That's hey, yeah. human nature. Um, so I'll do that. Um, if I am, oh, what's another example? Uh, if I'm scared of something, you'll hear my identity kick in. Like I'm the guy that when uh, I'm afraid of something, I do it. I prioritize it. I go after it. Um, so you'd literally hear those exact words run through my head. And um, yeah, those are three examples I'm sure I could go on. Uh, but that's what you would hear. It's, it's never like every day. I don't think there's really anything that I say to myself every day. Um, but depending on what pops up that right. day, like that'll be... You pull it off yeah, of the, exactly. the shelf, if you will. Exactly. And, and I really have tried to ingrain this stuff so that's super automatic. So that like, um, you know, when, when you have the impulse, like the impulse of fear is a trigger. It's a literal trigger for that loop of I'm the guy that moves towards that. And it's then like empowering. Mm -hmm. So fear actually like empowers me because it cre it triggers that positive loop. But you just have to work on that. It's repetition. Yeah. Right? You do it enough and then it becomes like the gap between stimulus and response like gets super brief. Do the reps. Do the reps. Do the reps. Indeed. Do the reps. All right, guys. I think we're rounding out our right. Facebook Live with that final question. Nice. Um, so just a few reminders. Don't forget to share this live feed if it's adding value to you guys so you can win an Impact Theory t-shirt. Um, and look out for the community group coming soon. Um, feel free to add me on Facebook, facebook.com slash Cindy, C-I-N-D-Y dot O-K-E, R-E-K-E. -E. Um. And... Also, sign up to our new newsletter just so you know any of the events we have coming up, um, anything that you can be a part of. And you can do that at impacttheory.com and mad love again to the one and only Agent Smith Agent for Smith. making that happen. Super, super grateful. Uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love doing these things. It is amazing. I love hearing your questions and getting the opportunity to answer them and connect directly with you guys. Thank you so much. You know that we are absolutely obsessed with the community that we're building. And man, if you're keeping score, this community is growing fast. It I is know. so cool. Uh, we are completely honored, very humbled, and incredibly excited to serve you and do dope things together so guys thank you so 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 much and until next time my friends be legendary take care everybody peace out toodles